David Wallace Wells is the deputy editor and climate columnist with New York Magazine. He's also author of The Uninhabitable Earth, an article that sparked widespread conversations about the climate crisis and became New York Magazine's most read article. David joins us now via satellite from New York. David, let's turn the lens on us uh, in the press for a little bit. How would you assess how the media is covering the climate crisis now versus in previous years? And what is it doing right and wrong? Well, I think big picture, um, we're doing better, but not well enough. I think that um, a generation from now, people will likely look back and wonder why climate change wasn't the biggest story on the front page of every newspaper every day and the lead item in every nightly news report. But um, I think that has been changing. There has been a lot more coverage over the last few years. And I think especially since the release of the IPCC's report a few months ago, a sort of alarmist report, um, I think that the media has really started to pay attention much more closely, not just in terms of the volume of coverage, but the tone of coverage. I think that it used to be that um, many journalists were a bit worried to talk about some of the scarier possibilities for climate change. And I think that that report really uh, marked a new era for climate journalism. And you see it in the coverage. There's a lot more um, focus on the really scary stuff that is possible out there. And that wasn't a report that even addressed issues that would come up past two degrees of warming. So I think there's still more to do there. I'm somebody who happens to believe that fear can be useful in, in motivating and um, mobilizing people. Um, and it used to not be a big part of how journalists wrote about climate. And I think it's, it's growing to be an important, significant part. Another major development is, I think, the subject that we're all talking about today, which is the emphasis on public health. I do think that um, two, five years ago, most people writing about climate change didn't do much thinking, didn't do much writing, didn't do much talking about public health. But more and more, as we see the way that it engages readers, watchers, listeners, um, and makes people who might have been kind of casual observers of climate, casually concerned about what was happening to the planet, turns them into much more concerned, much more engaged um, activists and quasi-activists. I think um, people are sounding the alarm on, on those public health issues more, and it's only likely to continue, which I think is great. It's, um, as I said, it's really, it seems to be really effective in hooking people, and anything that works, I think, is worth doing. Right. David, I'd like to ask you about your recent story on the cognitive impacts of pollution. How significant are the de developmental and cognitive effects? Well, there are, they're really significant um, from a certain perspective in that they're very pervasive and very, they show up in all of the data. This is not um, speculative science. Mm -hmm. um, the scale of the impacts are relatively small. Um, you know, on test scores, they tend to um, diminish test scores by maybe 10, 12 percent. Um, and, you know, the upticks in ADHD, memory function, um, autism spectrum disorders, tend to be in about that range. Um, those numbers can sound small. They're, they're really quite significant when you play them out over large populations, which is what we're doing. And that's the scale that really strikes me when I look at this data. Um, you see these, you know, these increases in these um, disorders, brain dysfunction, social disorders, as well as the health um, disorders across populations across the world. It's be especially dramatic in places like Delhi, where they have such terrible air pollution. Um, but even in the United States, it has a, has a major impact. And as everybody knows who's been watching the wildfire stories over the last few months, the air quality in California has, been, has gotten worse than anywhere else in the world. That's not permanent. It's not likely to um, have the kind of impacts in California that air pollution has in India, for, for instance, or had in China over the last few years. But those impacts are still really significant. And while I'm not someone who tends to put a lot of trust in test scores, if you see across a really large population a decline of, say, 10 percent, um, that's really meaningful. And if it plays out over years and decades, it could even conceivably impact our ability to deal with um, the climate crisis generally, because people will be, you know, we'll have a population of people who's brains are functioning less well going forward. That's a kind of dystopic um, outcome, but it's worth thinking about. Um, these effects accumulate, and many of them are lifelong. So we really have to you know, deal with the pollution in the air as quickly as we can, make sure that it's not affecting um, especially the brains of our children 
and um, you know, hope that we can solve that part of the crisis along with all the other parts of the crisis. Now, uh, I'd like to talk about a different kind of pollution. Uh, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, a place that's been disproportionately affected by lead pollution. And I want to ask you, what is still left to discover about the social damage caused by lead, uh, da you know, infestation and, uh, and lead pollution? Well, it's interesting you, you raise um, the lead analogy. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot. This is um, an area of research. It's a few decades old now, the effect of lead on a variety of um, social outcomes um, from IQ is the, is the most direct one. It's the most well-established one, but there's um, you know, a whole other set of social impacts. The one that seems most interesting to me personally is um, criminality. And when I look at the data, I see quite persuasive um, findings showing a correlation between exposure to lead in populations um, and the rise in, in criminal activity 15, 20 years later when the children who had been exposed are um, coming into maturity. And it's a kind of hypothetical, um, or I shouldn't say hypothetical, it's a speculative um, finding at the moment, but many researchers believe that this single pollutant um, was largely responsible for the spike in crime that the U.S. went through in beginning in the mid-60s and um, going through the late 80s. And when you think about the political impacts that that crime wave had, um, it's really almost single-handedly responsible for some of the law and order fear-mongering policing that we've seen um, over the last couple of decades. It's really striking. Um, and I think that you can, you can sort of imagine a future for air pollution along these same lines. The more that we learn about what air pollution is doing to our children um, and their development, developmental patterns, the scarier those findings will be. We've talked mostly about the cognitive impacts and the behavioral impacts, but there's also a really direct health impact. I mean, there are nine million people dying globally every year from air pollution. In the U.S., it's been estimated that as many as 200,000 early deaths could be prevented if we eliminated air pollution. These are not trivial numbers. That's an enormous number of, enormous number of lives. And I think that's one reason why um, these public health concerns have become so much more central to the way that people talk about the impacts of climate change. The numbers are so large, and um, you can't turn away from them. Well, uh, one last quick question. Uh, we only have about a minute. David, what is your vision for the future? I mean, I'm, you know, paraphrasing James Baldwin, I'm, 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 a pessimist, I'm not a pessimist because I'm alive. I hope that you're also an optimist. What can you see happening about, you know, in terms of humanity confronting this crisis? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons for hope. I mean, the, um, all of the trends in, um, in the technology and business sectors are really striking. Everything, all the green energy is getting cheaper. We know, we know now that rapid transition to a sustainable economy will save us trillions of lives very quickly. There's no economic trade-off anymore. And yet, I'm a little concerned that the, that transition isn't happening nearly as quickly as we need it to. That IPCC report that I mentioned earlier says that we need to have our carbon emissions in 12 years. That's a really rapid transition that will require a massive mobilization of public and private resources. And while there is growing focus on this issue, it seems a little bit slow, um, maybe even very slow. And so to my mind, to really hold off climate catastrophe of the kind that we're really worried about will require some kind of dramatic negative emissions technologies um, over the next decade or two decades. Thankfully, those prices are falling too. But again, um, we're very far from where we need to be. So the more political will, the more public action that can be taken, the better. Uh, thank you to David Wallace-Wells of New York Magazine for joining us on 24 Hours of Reality.